Okay, welcome back everyone. Our last 10 presenters are ready for the challenge. They have been anxiously waiting all day for their turn. So I'm very excited uh, to see their presentation. So let's jump right into it. So I'm gonna introduce our first uh, participant for HEAT3, uh, Anna Espinosa, who is uh, pursuing her Master of Science in Forensic Psychology, presenting jurors' perceptions of children testifying in their non-native language. Anna is an international student from Mexico, and her current research derives from her keen interest in studying factors that impact children's development and well-being. She loves practicing yoga and mindfulness. Please welcome Anna. Hi, Anna. You're all set? Yes, I am set. Can you Perfect. hear me? Yes, I can okay. hear you perfectly. Okay, let's uh, start the timer. Back in 2012, a toddler named Ezekiel passed away in Alberta. His parents were charged for failing to provide him the necessities of life. They were eventually acquitted in a trial in which the Nigerian doctor that performed his autopsy testified in English. However, the judge described this doctor's arguments as garbled and incomprehensible due to his accent, pronunciation, and grammar. If testifying in his non-native language so negatively affected how this adult expert witness was perceived, how do you think jurors might view children in similar situations? Or for instance, how would you feel if the three MT judges assessed non-native participants more negatively than the native ones just because of their way of speaking? The migration rates are predicted to keep rising. In fact, by 2036, it is expected that almost 50% of the children in Canada would be foreign-born or born to foreign-born parents. This increases the likelihood of interactions between institutional or legal authorities and non-native speakers. The fact is that we must rely on children's testimonies to solve and prosecute various crimes, such as maltreatment, like sexual abuse, especially in our increasingly global society that involves children testifying in their non-native language through, a, through an interpreter. Virtually, nothing is known about how potential jurors perceive interpreted mediated testimonies, specifically how testimonies affect the guilt verdict. In our study, we'll systematically and experimentally test mock jurors' perceptions of interpreted mediated interviews of child witnesses. Specifically, we'll be assessing the online surveys answered by participants after listening to different interviews, one of a child and one of an adolescent, both testifying about a crime, either in the presence or absence of an interpreter. We'll be addressing the following questions. How do mock jurors perceive children testifying via an interpreter, and what are the factors that affect these perceptions and the guilty verdict. We'll be analyzing the results using a two by two ANOVA design with the manipulated variables, the child's age and the interpreter's presence, and the outcome variables, the juror's perceptions such as accuracy or credibility and the guilty verdict. No witness should fear that their testimony would be discredited because of their manner of speech, such as what happened to Dr. Ayabo. Our study will yield valuable insights about the under-researched interpreter-mediated interviews, and it will help us determine the best way for non-native children to have their voices heard in the legal context. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. And I'll give the judges a couple moments to complete their scorecards. Okay, I'm going to introduce our next participant, Dawn Balston, who is pursuing her master's in health science and community, public, and population health, presenting Determining the Effectiveness of Canada's Drugs and Substances Strategy, a re-aim project. Dawn is a busy mom of four, a registered nurse, and writes young adult paranormal romance novels. She enjoys being outdoors and hiking with her kids and dogs and loves to cook. Please welcome Dawn. Hi, Dawn. Hi. Can everybody hear me okay? Perfectly. Okay, you're all set. Let's start the timer. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm here today to discuss something that's going to make you feel uncomfortable, but we have to have the talk anyhow. What I'm here today to talk about is the fact that there's many Canadians that are um, addicted to opiates in our Canadian society. And what I want to know is how many of you have been affected by opiate, the opiate crisis? Raise your hand. If your hand isn't up, it should be. Because for every Canadian over age 18, there's one prescription for opiates written every year in Canada. That makes Canada the second most frequent prescriber of opiates in the world. And if that doesn't drive the message home, 
one in six Canadians have, um, sorry, have said that they have misused opiates in the past. So I couldn't believe this when I first heard this. It's, it's shocking. And I, I almost forgot to congratulate Canada because it's been 25 years um, since the decision by Health Canada to allow opiates to be prescribed for the general public for pain management. This began a slippery slope where the number of opiate related deaths increased and our government sought to fight a war on drugs. And with that war on drugs, there was increased intensified criminalization. And this did not help the opiate crisis in Canada. It wasn't until five years ago when the Trudeau government in 2016 realized and recognized that treatment rather than criminalization was going to be the answer. And they resituated the opiate crisis from the Department of Justice as a public health crisis. And at that point, they created what was called the or is called the Canadian Drugs and Substances Strategy. But a lot has changed in these past five years, as we all know, with COVID-19. And the CDSS needs to be re-examined. We need to understand what's happening now. So if you refer to the chart that's on my um, slide, you'll see that over the past five years, there hasn't been a lot of decrease in the average number of people that are dying from opiate-related deaths. And on the far end of the graph, the tail, you'll see that there's three projections, one in purple, one in green, and one in red. The one in purple is if we are able to stop 60% of the deaths in, during COVID-19. Well, but what I want you to focus on is the red one. The red one is if we can only stop 20% of the deaths during COVID-19, and that's where we are, we're in the red. My research is about putting together a quality improvement plan that utilizes the REAIM framework to look at the effectiveness of these interactions. Now is the time for us to come together. We're all in this together. Thank you, Don. We'll give the judges a few moments now with their scorecards. Okay, I'll introduce our next participant, Sarah Fitzgerald, uh, pursuing Masters of Health Science and Kinesiology, presenting the effects of mental fatigue on novel perceptual motor tasks. Sarah has a passion for learning and exploring new things. She loves to swim, skate, run, and read. Please welcome Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Hi, can you guys all hear me? Yes, perfectly. Okay, okay perfect. we'll start the timer. How do you feel right now? Are you fully paying attention to me? Or are you distracted, thinking about what you're going to be doing after I'm done talking? See, you're busy, so these distracting thoughts are normal. The problem is, these thoughts and drowning out these thoughts can cost you mental energy. And this use of mental energy can build up and cause mental fatigue. Now, you're probably familiar with the idea of mental fatigue. It's that brain fog feeling that you get when you've been working too hard that makes it hard to think. But what you might not know is that mental fatigue can actually change the way that you move. See, mental fatigue has been shown to decrease success in perceptual motor tasks. That's tasks that use your senses to allow you to be physically accurate, like throwing a basketball through a hoop. The problem is we don't actually know how mental fatigue does this. And that's where my master's thesis comes in. See, my research team and I have come up with an experiment that will allow us to measure the effect that mental fatigue has on accuracy, learning, and biomechanics of novel perceptual motor tasks. Our first step in setting up this experiment was to come up with a way to consistently induce mental fatigue in our participants. We decided to use something called a Stroop test. Now, for this Stroop test, we're going to be showing our participants a series of flashcards with color words on them, printed in colored ink that does not correspond with the colored words. Participants are going to be expected to be able to identify the color of the ink on the card and not the color word. Our second step in setting up this experiment was to come up with a novel perceptual motor task that would be new to most participants, easy to measure in the lab, with clear outcomes. We decided that throwing darts at a dartboard worked absolutely perfectly. So, as soon as the pandemic allows, we're going to be inviting two groups of participants into our lab. 
we're going to have our first group of participants perform two series of dart throws, one before and one after, being mentally fatigued by this Stroop test. Our second group of participants is going to be performing two series of dart throws, one before and one after a period of mental rest. Now we hypothesize that we're going to be seeing changes in accuracy, muscular activation, and biomechanics between these two groups. But why does this even matter? Well, this matters because a lot of jobs that are available today require you to use both mental energy and be physically accurate. Take, for example, the job of a surgeon who needs to use mental energy to pay attention to complex medical cases, but needs to be physically accurate while performing surgery to maintain the safety of their patients. We hope that the research we're doing here will help to make the world safer by giving us a better understanding of how mental fatigue affects movement. Thank you for listening and hopefully this presentation wasn't too mentally fatiguing. Thank you, Sarah. We'll give the judges a few minutes for their scorecards. Okay, I'm gonna introduce our next participant, uh, David McDaffey, uh, pursuing his Master's of Science in Applied Bioscience, presenting Harmful Algal Blooms. What's our eight minutes? David loves to swim, his favorite color is orange. He has four cats and is a fully licensed aerial exterminator who is treated for mosquitoes and biting flies in a remote town in Labrador. Please welcome David. Hi, David. Hello. Hi, you guys can hear me okay? Yep, you sound great. Okay, okay great. Let's get started. In the summer of 2012, a solar flare was hurtling towards Earth, warning us that something extremely dangerous was going to happen. While solar flares are normal, they're often warning signs of an imminent solar storm. Beginning as explosions on the surface of the sun, solar flares give us about eight minutes of warning before X-rays and extreme ultraviolet radiation reach Earth. Following those rays, charged particles knock out satellite electronics, disrupting GPS and other forms of communication. Finally, billion-ton clouds of magnetized plasma accelerate towards Earth, breaking anything that uses electricity. It's a nightmare that would bring us back to the Stone Age, but luckily for us, that solar storm missed us by about nine days. Also in the summer of 2012, blooms of algae were stirring in the lakes of the Kaworthas. While algal blooms are normal, they can often become toxic and wreak havoc. They begin as harmless green communities floating on the surfaces of lakes, but then they can cover everything in thick, soupy green mats of algae, becoming monstrous in size and giving off foul odors. Next, certain species within the bloom make toxic molecules that can impair or kill fish and pets, or even make humans sick. Finally, when the blooms eventually die, the algae sink to the bottom of the lake, where bacteria use up all the oxygen in the water to decompose them, creating areas of what's known as hypoxia, where the water is devoid of oxygen. These areas of hypoxia can move around the lake, choking out fish unlucky enough to get in their way. It's a nightmare for our lakes, but luckily for those in the Kaworthas, not all blooms became harmful that summer. But why is that? Unlike solar flares, which are the indicators that a solar storm is imminent, we don't know what indicates a switch from a normal algal bloom to a harmful algal bloom before it's too late. This means that we don't know what the equivalent eight minutes of warning is between a normal bloom and one that can kill fish and make us sick. To try and figure out what that indicator is and to know how long we have to prepare for a harmful algal bloom, we have to look at things on a molecular level. What if we could look at the metabolites produced by the algae? Metabolites are products of metabolism, growth, and toxin production. And by using liquid chromatography and mass spectrometry, we can isolate these molecules from consecutive weeks of water sampling to identify which might be that indicator that we're looking for. If we know what that indicator is, we can close beaches early to prevent any humans or animals from becoming sick. We can implement preventative algae control devices such as aeration or water bubbling. And ultimately, we can reduce the impact of harmful algal blooms as much as possible. Now, algal blooms are expected to become more and more frequent as the climate continues to change. Therefore, finding a molecular switch to indicate when these blooms will become toxic is imperative if we want to continue safely enjoying our lakes. One day, we will determine what our equivalent eight minutes is, and whether it's 60 minutes, 12 hours, or two days, whatever it is, hopefully it will be enough time to allow us to take control over these green monsters once and for all. Thank you. Thank you, David. Okay, we'll give the judges a few moments. Okay, I'll introduce our next participant, Abdulrahman Elshora, who is pursuing Master of Applied Science in Electrical and Computer Engineering, presenting novel design of DC-DC converter for fast charging station. 
Abdul Rahman is an Egyptian master student of electrical engineering, interested in power electronics, renewable energy, and volunteering work. He was a member of the electric team of the Invictus ROV or ROV team that won fourth place in the world at the Meet uh, ROV or ROV competition. His hobbies are playing soccer and reading. Please welcome Abdul Rahman. Hi there, are you all set? Okay, could you hear me now? Oh, perfect. Yep, you're all set. Okay, we'll start the timer. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. We all observed this winter was warmer compared to the last year and the previous years. As this winter was maybe the ma maximum degree was minus 15 or minus 10. Compared to the last year, it was reaching minus 20 or more than less than minus 20. One of the, one of the suggestion reasons for this calm winter is climate change. The climate change become one of the big problems that the world faces today. Therefore, the governments and organizations and number of organizations setting rules and regulations to face this problem. One of the main reasons, one of the main sources of the CO2 emissions is the transportation sector. For example, in Canada, the transportation sector produces 28% of CO2 emissions. Therefore, the Canadian government always talking about uh, zero emissions vehicles and electric vehicle infrastructure. The Canadian government setting a plan by 2040, the electric vehicles will be 100% in our streets. However, this technology faces a lot of problems. One of the main problems is this, its high price compared to the traditional vehicles. In addition, the low number of fast charging stations, and this causes run, uh, range inconsistency. For example, in Ashwa, we only have five fast charging stations, and this doesn't encourage the people to use this technology. My research is focusing in designing a novel multi-input uh, bidirectional DC-DC converter to increase the number of fast charging stations. The converter can, uh, can easily edit energy sources like batteries, ultra-capacitor, flywheels, and also have a novelty to edit uh, renewable energy sources. This will increase the number of uh, fast charging stations and encourage the people to use this technology. And by this, we can face this problem of the climate change. In addition, by adding energy sources like batteries or flywheels or capacitors, this will mitigate the load in the grid. So this will increase the prices of the electric, the prices of electricity on the grid. Um, in addition, by using this converter, we can charge the electric vehicles in less than 30 minutes instead of two hours, uh, three hours. And also, as uh, as we know, one of the main problems of using electric vehicles is high time of charging the electric vehicles. Thank you. This is for you. Do you have any questions? <laughs> no, thank you so much. Uh, we'll just give the judges a few moments uh, with their scorecards. Thank you. OK, I'll introduce our next participant. Sharif Abu Darda, who is pursuing his PhD in nuclear engineering, presenting management and optimization solutions of high level radioactive waste. Sharif loves to watch TV shows and movies, play football, cricket, and bike riding. He's also interested in global politics and foreign policies. Please welcome Sharif. Hi. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you perfectly well. Good okay. afternoon, everyone. <laughs> okay, we'll get started. Currently, there is no permanent disposal facilities for high-level radioactive waste. And there are about 250,000 tons of high-level radioactive waste stored worldwide. In Canada, it's about 64,000 tons. Storing high-level radioactive waste is really expensive. It takes about $1.5 million just to store 10 tons of high-level radioactive waste. Don't get alarmed. If I told you that we have the shrinking technology from Dr. Pim in Anmet, and that the storage volume of high-level radioactive waste can be reduced up to 96% from traditional reactors and from CANDU reactor, it can be over 99.5%. How you say? You see the high-level radioactive waste coming from traditional BWR and PWR reactor has about 4% fission products, and those are the highly radioactive elements that needs to be stored. The rest, 96% volume, are just actinides, and those can be reused as reactor fuel. Same goes for the CANDU reactor. You have over 99.5% actinides and less than 0.5% fission products. 
So how do you separate out the fission products from actinides? That's where plasma mass separation system comes into action. You take the highly radioactive waste sample treated with plasma in a chamber of cross magnetic and electric field and in high vacuum. Because of the high temperature of plasma, which can reach up to 10,000 degrees Celsius, the sample is atomized. And because of the cross magnetic and electric field, the high mass elements, in this case, the actinides having the mass between 200 to 250 AMU will be thrown radially. And same case for the low mass elements, which has a mass between 80 to 180 AMU, the fission products will be accumulated axially. So using plasma mass separation system, you get a separate stream of high mass elements from low mass elements. And that way you separate out the uh, fission products from actinides from the high level radioactive waste sample. So my research is focusing on designing a generic plasma mass separation system using COMSOL multi-physics simulation tool and optimizing the system. So thank you for being here with, uh, with me and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Sharif. Uh, the judges will now take a few moments uh, to complete their scorecards. Okay, I'm gonna introduce our next participant, Chirag Karia, who is pursuing Master's of Science in Computer Science, presenting Predicting Multi-Human Motion with Computer Vision. Chirag is a lifelong lover of science fiction and wishes to combine his background in software engineering with the cutting edge of AI research to help make the dreams of Asimov and Clark a reality. When not doing research, Chirag enjoys reading, cooking, and meddling around inside his computer. <laughs> Please welcome Chirag. Hi there, do you want to do a mic check? Uh, yeah, can everyone hear me? Oh, perfect. Thank you, you sound great. So okay, we'll get the timer started. I want everyone to take a second and think about how to answer the following question. How do you throw a ball to someone? And I don't just mean the physical act, but like, how do you throw a ball and make sure it gets to them while they're moving? You see, the answer to this question is a lot deeper than it sounds, because it's the same thing that informs everything we do from driving to formation flying. Humans have an innate ability to model an ever-changing environment. We are, all of us, predicting the future, albeit by only a few seconds. This ability lets us do things like forecasting roughly where our target is going to be and fitting a parabolic curve to make sure the ball gets where they are. And we don't even think about it. Now, I've been captivated by the idea of artificially intelligent systems that work alongside us. So naturally, the huge progress we've made in the past decade is like a dream come true for me. However, if, if we do wanna make things like robots that can physically interact with the world, we need, try, need to try and make sure we can understand the world like us. But most importantly, we need to make sure we can understand us. While the prior of these two is exceedingly difficult, the latter grows ever more achievable. The first foray into understanding humans in an image or video started with bounding boxes. They were good for providing a rough estimate of where a person is. Then the industry started working with key points, points that mark important joints um, in 2D or 3D space, and they give you a, a rough idea of pose. Both of these paradigms were extended from simple extraction and are now widely used for more involved tasks, like predicting future uh, bounding boxes or skeletal models um, based on film strips that are consisting of past frames. Then in 2015, uh, the Max Planck Institute of Intelligent Systems released the SMPL body model. It's an acronym that stands for something long and complex, so we'll just keep it simple. The researchers 3D scanned roughly 4,000 people and used this to create a machine learning capable approximation of the human body. 2015 may not seem like a long time ago, but that's an eon. Since then, SMPL models have been used in tasks like multi-person reconstruction, and even to reconstruct future predictions of a single person uh, from a cropped video. My research focuses on building a system that can take in a video containing multiple people and predict a consistent reconstruction um, of all of their positions and poses in the next few seconds. This has the potential to be huge in applications that involve human-robot interactions, like self-driving cars. You might be wondering why this is significant compared to simply using the crop-based prediction repeatedly. And the key difference is 
the, with the method we're developing, we aim to capture the context of the interactions between individuals. This is important for things like when you throw a ball, because with the ball being thrown, you know how people are going to react, what's about to happen. By cropping the image and predicting each one uh, separately, you lose sight of the bigger picture. Sure, bounding boxes and key points are good, but is good where we want to be set our bar? Thank you. Thank you. We'll give the judges a few moments. Okay, I'm going to introduce our next participant, uh, Sami Al-Jabbar, who's pursuing his Master of Applied Science in Electrical and Computer Engineering, presenting a methodology of structuring knowledge from instructive texts using human experience semantic network. Sami is originally from Bangladesh and is a technology enthusiast. He completed his Bachelor of Science in Computer Science and Engineering in 2018 and started his career as a software engineer shortly after. Please welcome Sami. Hi, Sami. Oh, perfect. Hi. Okay. <laughs> okay, so I'm clear, right? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right, so we'll start the timer. All right. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, instruction manual, guideline, operational procedure, etc., are followed to accomplish different tasks or operation. For example, how to install a software, what are the list of steps to fix a turbine, and so on. The texts used in these documents are called instructive text, and my research deals with the structuring knowledge from this kind of text. Now, this is serious. If we consider a large industry such as nuclear power plant, there are thousands of these documents which give rise to the following problems. Number one, it is time consuming to search and locate the instructions of a specific operation from all of these documents, especially if someone is in the middle of a critical operation where the information needs to be retrieved quickly and accurately. Number two, less experienced employee will not be able to perform complex operations due to having a lack of knowledge about the documents and the operation. As a result, they need to be trained, which is again time consuming and costs a lot for the industry. Number three, it is also troublesome to replace an experienced employee after they move to other department or retirement. Hence, we propose a methodology of learning and structuring knowledge from these documents. It is called Human Experience Semantic Network or HESEN. It looks for different terms and key phrases, which could be an entity or an action term like move, lift, shift, etc., or an attribute like pressure, condition, status, and so on. It then creates a relationship among these terms in the form of a network. And this network is the building block of Hessen. We get one network for each instruction of an, of an op operation. So from Hessen, we get information about different entity found in the document. But the unique part here is Hessen captures information about each entity differently for different operation. For example, you can see here, we have two instructions, two different instructions from two different operations. The first one says, water pump has to have pressure of three Pascal. And the second one say the water pump has to have pressure of seven Pascal. So we have the same entity, water pump. We have the same attribute pressure, but two different values for two different operations. This structuring is done using Hessen and that is my research. So this Hessen can be used to develop software systems, which we learn from the documents and make itself ready to answer questions when asked by an employee. This will make the learning process faster and less experienced personnel will also be able to participate in complex operation. And this will lead to saving a huge, huge amount of money for the large industries. Thank you. Thank you, Sammy. Okay, we'll give the judges a few moments with their scorecards. Sure. Okay, I'll introduce our next participant, Michael Short, uh, pursuing his PhD in Health Sciences, Community, Public and Population Health, presenting Exploring the Lived Experiences of Female Canadian Veterans on Their Pathway to Homelessness. Michael is an avid musician, guitar and bass, multi-sport athlete, motivational speaker, and tutor. The only time he ever sits still is when reading a scientific paper. Michael worked as an axe throwing coach for two years during his undergrad. Please welcome Michael. Hi, Michael. Hi, can you hear me okay? Perfect. Good to go. Okay, we'll start the time. Right, awesome. Okay, so we all dream of retirement. Uh, after 20, 30, 40 years of work, uh, we look at kind of sitting back and relaxing, spending time with the family, going on that vacation we always dreamed of, uh, and just having time for our own. Now, for three to 5,000 Canadian veterans, this dream has become a nightmare. They find themselves homeless and on the street. More problematically, we find that female veterans are overrepresented in this community. For example, out of all Canadian veterans, 15% are female. When we look at the homeless veteran population, 
we notice that 30% are female. And the truth of the matter is we just don't know why. That's where my research comes in. My research answers a call put forth by the Standing Committee of Veteran Affairs uh, towards investigating what is happening with uh, homeless uh, female veteran uh, status. Why is it going on? I'll be using a life course perspective and intersectionality framework to really dive deep and understand the lived experiences of our female Canadian veterans that find themselves on the street. Now, if we look towards current literature that's coming out of the United States, what we find is that homeless female veterans have higher incident rates of things such as military sexual trauma, which may be caused by subordinates or higher ranking personnel. Uh, they have higher preva prevalence of childhood abuse, which we've seen can drive a teenager into enlisting into the military to escape a tragic home life. We also see higher rates of substance use uh, and mental health illness. And now we really don't know how these things are combining to cause this homelessness or how it's affecting veterans. So much, much more research is needed. My research will gather information using a life history grid and semi-structured interviews, uh, recruiting homeless veterans from Toronto, Montreal, London, Hamilton, and Oshawa. Now, we plan on incorporating stakeholders very early in the process using an integrated knowledge translation approach. These stakeholders will be involved right from the creation of the data collection tool to the interpretation of the results, and then finally to the application of those results so that we can serve the Canadian soldiers that serve our country proudly. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. We'll give the judges a few moments. Okay, I'm gonna introduce our last presenter in heat three, uh, Lillian Mack, uh, pursuing her Master of Arts in Education, presenting Leverage Online Collaboration to Develop College Students' Critical Academic Writing Skills. Lillian is a dog lover who enjoys walks in and around the city, a good cup of coffee, and the smell of freshly baked apple pie. Lillian's dream day would include a long walk with a dog companion and an afternoon nap. Please welcome Lillian. Hi, Lillian. Hi, good afternoon. <laughs> I can hear you very well, so we're, we're good to go. Okay. Great. Thank we'll you. Start, we'll start the timer. Okay. 89% of students beginning university cannot correctly grasp the main idea when multiple ideas are presented to them. Okay, so that's at the beginning of university. And by the time they graduate, many will have learned how to do that. However, there's still a lot of them leaving that can't. And they're going to find their way into organizations much like yours. So what does that mean for you? Information and the decisions that happen on a daily basis. How will they make sense of everything? Consider the cost in time for training, productivity, employee morale. As an educator, I find it frustrating sometimes to be faced with students who can't seem to grasp the ideas properly or that have difficulty in understanding. It might be the language, it might be the subject matter, but it's just things don't seem to be fitting in and it can be frustrating for both students and for me. As a company, you may have the same difficulties or frustrations during training sessions when some people seem to pick things up quickly and others don't. Now, imagine if you could intervene in such a way that you could help them learn new skills and become more self-reliant and confident. And it wouldn't have to cause any new ideas or something to be created for it. In many cases, the solutions exist. We're just not using them optimally. My research focuses on how a structured learning and online collaboration can be combined for a better learning experience. Having a defined structure methodology 
helps people to follow easily and comfortably. And online collaboration connects people and it allows them to learn from each other on an ongoing basis. People are already accustomed to working in teams where they build on each other's strengths and experiences to solve problems or create something new. We can do that in the classroom using a structured design and an online collaborative tool called OneNote. Students became more engaged in their learning. They were able to disseminate information and write clear, cohesive arguments. Results have shown that students have improved in their writing. And it makes me optimistic that over time, it won't be frustration that we'll be seeing around us, but rather the satisfaction that comes from seeing all the pieces come together. Thank you. Thank you, Lillian. We'll give the judges a few moments. Okay, thank you to all of our students from Heat 3. Everyone did it. You can uh, applaud yourselves and have a big sigh of relief. <laughs> so let's give all of our presenters from, from today a big round of virtual applause. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs> Definitely not the same effect as in person, but we, we, we did our best. Um, okay, so our judges are now going to be taking a, a deliberation break, um, and we are like right on schedule. I think we're scheduled to come back at two o'clock to announce our six finalists um, going on to our final on Thursday. Um, but if the judges do need a couple extra minutes, that, that's totally fine. We'll just aim for two, and if you need a little bit longer, um, that, that's okay too. <laughs> okay. So uh, we'll see everyone uh, back here in uh, 15 odd minutes or so.